Greetings, and I'm pleased to say that I'm really delighted to be here um, and to have an opportunity to talk to you about what I call neural philosophy. <clears throat> and that is a subject matter that is kind of at the interface between the philosophical questions about the nature of the mind and how we think and decide how it is that we're conscious and on the other hand, developments in neuroscience. One of the most remarkable things I think in neuroscience in the last 25 years or so have been the technological developments that have allowed us to investigate the brain in much finer and much more profound ways than were possible uh, ever before. And I'm going to start actually by talking about consciousness, partly because that is an area that has been considered so mysterious that no one could ever make any progress on it. And yet, and yet we see progress in neuroscience of a very distinct and very important kind. Now, with regard to the question about the nature of consciousness, roughly speaking, there are two approaches. One is to develop a great grand exotic theory about the nature of the phenomenon itself. And it is typically kind of very rich in metaphor, uh, but very data poor. The other approach, and, and this is one that I favor, is to try to make progress on a very specific question about some aspect of the nature of conscious experience. Now, we might want to begin with a definition of consciousness, but as with any phenomenon whose science is not yet really well understood, we can't give a, a precise explicit definition. But what we can do is make certain kinds of contrasts between conscious states and other states and ask the question, what's the difference in the brain? And in particular, what I'm going to look at today are two questions. What is the difference in the brain between someone who is about to have an epileptic seizure and has dissociative phenomena, meaning they have experiences which they don't consider to be theirs? And what's the difference in the brain when we're under general anesthesia and not. And in both cases, we've learned a lot. Now we have in anesthesia a very practical problem. We want during surgical procedures to reduce pain or abolish pain. If you're having knee surgery, for example, you do not want uh, to experience the pain of having that surgery accomplished. So this is really not about zombies or about what is conceivable by somebody in some possible fancy wor fantasy world. This is about the kinds of procedures that people like you and I undergo, about root canals, appendectomies, kidney stones, amputations, gunshot removal. It's about pain and the loss of consciousness. Interestingly, by and large, the great grand theories of the nature of consciousness, such as that everything in the world, including protons, cow pies, and fungus are conscious, have essentially nothing to say about how we reduce pain during surgery. This is a slide just to remind you that surgery is not just a sort of sweet casual affair. It does involve removal of structures and is often extremely painful. And even something like a root canal can be very, very painful if you have no anesthesia. Now, cocaine in the 1880s was the first drug that was used in dental and eye surgery to reduce pain. And by about 1905, it was replaced by procaine, or as we might call it, novocaine. And the novocaine, since I'm sure we've all been to the dentist, is injected right next to the tooth that is going to be worked on. Now, how does procaine work? 
Is it spooky? Is it weird? Does it involve uh, prayer? No. What it does is it operates on the neurons, the nerves themselves, and it changes the structure of the neuron so that the neuron cannot spike and hence cannot send a signal to the brain. And so amazingly, you feel numb and you do not feel pain that you would otherwise feel. I want now to turn to general anesthesia because that's a place where for many years people use particular um, general anesthesias such as ether, which was the first use was in the 19th century. I mean, just think about that. Before that time, people had their legs removed, they had tumors removed without it benefit of anesthesia. They were maybe given whiskey, uh, but that didn't help very much. So what do we know about propofol, which is the, the general anesthetic, which is most widely used? And we have two very important domains of research. One is research on humans and the other is on non-human primates. Emery Brown at Mass General is a, a gen, a, a, an anesthesiologist. And he's been very concerned both for practical and theoretical reasons about how it is that propofol actually does the job that it does. And he has run large scale experiments on healthy humans who were volunteers to see if you administer propofol very slowly over time and then reduce it and, and uh, stop the propofol very slowly over time, what precisely happens in the brain? Using Emory Brown's results, um, people in Earl Miller's lab realized that what we had to do was not only put electrodes on the scalp of humans undergoing propofol anesthesia, but we wanted to put those electrodes right into the brain itself to precisely find out whether specific cells are involved and if they are, how they change. And so this work is very recent, the work on non-human primates. Basically the story is that it is entirely consistent with the research on humans. So what does it actually do? How does propofol render us unconscious? How is it that we feel nothing, hear nothing, see nothing when we are under the influence of propofol? The fast answer is that there is a large decrease in the firing rate of neurons in two structures, the cortex and in the thalamus. Now, it turns out that there's a more fine-grained answer. Um, but first of all, you might say, well, how does it change the firing rate of, um, of neurons in these areas? And the answer is that it interacts with an inhibitory transmitter, namely GABA, to increase the functionality of GABA. It enhances GABA. So let's go into a little more detail about how propofol renders us unconscious. The answer is kind of multifactorial because it involves large regions of the brain. And so it's not just in a tiny area that there is a reduction of spiking rate, but it looks like in the conscious state, you have a kind of coordination of responses to input from externally as well as internal input involving motivation and hunger and thirst. You have large coordinated responses over wide areas. And that with propofol, it's as though the coordination drops out of the picture that we see uh, small regions that are, are, are coordinated within themselves, but there's a lack of coherence across the brain. Now in this slide, it's a little bit complicated, but this is the slide uh, that is taken from the work on non-human primates. And 
what you're seeing in slide A are the results of the electrodes put in four specific regions of cortex and to see how the uh, firing rate changes when propofol is introduced. And it's introduced at this double line. And these are the four specific regions, prefrontal cortex area 8A, which is also frontal, posterior parietal cortex, which is more towards the back, superior temporal gyrus, which is sort of middle rear. And basically what you're looking at then, LOC means loss of consciousness. And we see that right here and recovery of consciousness and the dotted line uh, begins to mark that. The way that that is determined is responsivity to uh, a particular sound stimulus. We can go into that later. But what you're looking at then is really quite remarkable. And that is that the firing rate uh, before the propofol is introduced is at these levels. And notice that it's not exactly the same in all of those regions, but as propofol is introduced, the firing rate drops. And when there is loss of consciousness, you see the firing rate go way, way down. And in B, what we're looking at is ROC, recovery of consciousness. So you see that the firing rates are very low, propofol is turned off, and recovery begins and firing rate increases. Now, this is really quite a stunning discovery, but it's not exactly interpretable as though the brain itself all shuts down. In actual fact, what happens is... That to continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.